Now, okay. All right. The recording has started, right? <laughs> All right. Awesome. All right. Now, uh, Dirajan, hope you can see my screen and the others. Yeah, yeah I can. I can. Like yeah. All right. All right. So, let me just put this on full screen. So, good evening, everyone. After two weeks, we are back. And I'd like to welcome all of you to this third session of our uh, introduction to networking. Let me just, right, I'm actually working on two computers at the moment. Let me just change from this one to this one. And all right. So in this session, we'll look at IP addresses and routing because I think IP addresses is some of, one of the most important aspects of networking and anyone who's looking to get an understanding or fundamentals of networking has to have an understanding about IP addresses and routing. So let's continue, right? So first of all, I think the biggest question that you need to ask is actually what is an what is the internet protocol or IP, right? What does it stand for? So Internet protocol is actually a protocol or a set of rules, right? Because in networking, uh, we can describe protocol as a standardized way of doing certain actions and formatting data and communicating. And this kind of standardization is needed because you're not com communicating between just two parties, right? There could be a number of different hosts or devices connected to a network. And these devices have to be able to communicate and understand each other, right? Because imagine that uh, you need to speak to a computer that's on the other side of the world. And if the other guy is using a different standard and you're using a different standard, and let's say that the other guy is saying, oh, for an IP address, I'm going to, use a string that's 100 characters long. You're going to say, no, it should be 10 characters long. That kind of discrepancy doesn't work because you're not just, talk, we're not just talking about the two endpoints that are communicating with, the, with each other because that IP packet, that data has to actually travel through the network. And if those intermediary devices don't understand the data, understand the IP protocol, then they won't be able to get that data to the right destination, right? So it should be agreed upon by everyone. That's why the protocol is important. And it allows for routing and addressing. This standard is what allows for addressing the packets of data, right? Now, imagine that, let's look at a bit of an, a little bit of an example, right? Imagine you're sending a letter to someone else, maybe your friend that's on the other side of the country or maybe in a different country. I'm talking about snail mail, right? One that you post in the mail with a stamp, right? And when you're writing the address on the envelope, right? You have to follow a certain order, right? The name, house number, street name, street address, city, then country, and zip code, right? You have to have, you have to follow that order unless uh, when you hand that envelope in, the post office and the intermediary post offices that are going to deliver that post to the intended destination wouldn't be able to find where it is, right? So imagine you're sending it to another district. You have to write the district, you have to write the city, you have to write the street number, you have to write the house number or postal address uh, number, right? And if one of those datums are missing, then the post office wouldn't be able to do their job, right? So this is why the standard has to be there. So it can be followed by everyone. So everyone follows the agreed upon protocol that's being used by that system all the way from beginning to the end, right? So 
this is what this is what this example of an IP address being sent across the internet as a joke, right? Like I said before, the IP address follows a certain specific protocol, a standard. And if you don't configure your IP address the same way, the intermediary routers or the devices that are carrying your data to the other side, to the recipient, wouldn't be able to understand what the hell you have put on there. So they'll just drop it, right? So uh, this is a typical uh, IP address and you can see that it's being sent to the intended destination, right? So an IP address is essentially like a name, an identifier for an endpoint or a computer. If you look at your own computer, you'll be able to uh, look at your IP address. We'll look at it a little bit later, right? So when we look at an IP address, there are certain fields that are present within that IP address, right? And I think best way would be actually to look at an actual IP packet, right? Uh, now, at this point, I hope you guys have Wireshark. And if you don't, it's fine. Let's actually look at some actual traffic, right? I'm just going to capture some traffic from this computer, right? And let me just stop it there. And let me look at that. And as you can see, this is a visual representation of an IP packet, the data that's being transmitted through it. Now, what Wireshark does is actually visualize and analyze this data. So Wireshark is a really neat tool. Uh, we'll go into Wireshark a little bit later in a later session, but just for the sake of brevity, it's used for packet analysis. And if you look at this, you can see that a packet is actually uh, this part. It's encapsulated, we'll discuss that a little bit later, but in an IP address, what I wanted to show you guys was the source address and the destination address. As you can see, this is my address right here. Now we can actually look at my address right now. And it's actually 1.34. Now go ahead and type in IP config in your own computer and see what your IP address is, right? Find out what it is and maybe put it in the chat for me to see. Go ahead, guys. Or you can unmute and speak. Either way should be good. So it's open up the command prompt, go to start, CMD and click this and you should see a black box appear, right? In here, type in IP config and that's it. So was anyone able to find their own IP address? No one? All right, anyways, <laughs> let's continue then. Uh, do go through the recording and maybe uh, try to find the IP address a little bit later. It's fine. All right, let's get back to the presentation and continue from here. Oops. All right, so when we look at an IP address, there are a number of different fields that are present in an IP address, but 
every IP address, IP packet has a header. This actually precedes the data and it tells the intermediary network devices where that packet needs to go. So the source address is the address of the sender or if you're sending some data to another person, your IP address will be in the source and the destination address would be their address, right? So let's go through these fields and I'll briefly describe the fields and their function. We'll not go, go into <clears throat> sorry, great detail, but uh, first one is version. It's always going to be four because it, this is an IP version four packet. There are IP version six as well, but we'll look at them later, right? And the header length is actually the length of this header field. And type of service is actually the, it's called TOS byte or the TOS field. It uh, sets or differentiates the service uh, quality. So if you have something like uh, voice over IP or video streaming or any other live traffic that needs prioritization, that's where we will configure it. So imagine that you're in an office network and you have some uh, IP phones, right? And that traffic needs to have priority because voice traffic needs to travel in real time, right? Now imagine if you have, if you're having a conversation with someone else and what you're speaking arrives late and what you're speaking is uh, segmented into different chunks and those chunks arrive at different times. What I'm saying right now arrives early and what I'm saying next comes later. That's how it should be. But let's say that that order changes and it's slow and that service becomes unusable, right? So that's why the type of service field is there, right? And the total length is the length of the IPv4 packet, including the header and the data, right? It's, it, it tells the network device what's the total length of the packet, right? And identification, it's used to reassemble fragments because uh, IP actually allows for fragmenting larger packets into smaller ones. And that's what identification is for. IP flags, again, is for control bits used for fragmentation. So it says either fragment this data packet or don't fragment it. And the fragment offset is actually for if the data is fragmented, that's the offset. Now, time to leave, on the other hand, is used to track how many routers that the packet packet has gone through. Now this is very important actually. Time to reveal uh, look at it in later in a packet capture. Time to leave is actually when when that packet goes through a router that value is decreased by one. This is actually used to prevent looping because if a network packet goes through an improperly configured network and there's a loop, that packet will be traveling in that network forever, right? Because there's no end. But with time to leave, every time when the packet goes through a router, it's decreased by one. So that's very important. We'll look at some examples of where time to live would be used a little bit later in this session. And protocol is actually denoting TCP or UDP. We'll look at it a little bit later. Uh, and the header checksum is actually there to uh, give an indication whether some of the data is corrupted or not. So it calculates a checksum, a value that's given you can check at the other end to see whether it has arrived without any of the bits being altered. And source address and destination address I have already discussed. Uh, one more thing before we move forward. Let's go back to that packet capture. And let's go to 
I'm going to say packet bytes. Now, like I've said before, no matter what abstract notions that we use to describe networking, at the end of the day, this is what we put into the wire, right? It's all ones and zeros, right? So when we transmit something, right, this combination of ones and zeros are what those devices, whether it's a computer, whether it's a network switch, whether it's a firewall, whether it's any other load balance or any other advanced uh, machine that's receiving that data, it's looking at these ones and zeros, right? So these sequences matter. So if one of these changes, it may change the context and the value of that packet and that traffic. And it could be rendered null, right? It could be rendered useless. So this is the reason why that header checksum is needed, right? So like I said, time to live. And then there's uh, UDP, we'll look at that later. We don't need to look at it right now. All right, let's get back to it. And encapsulation. Now, this is a very important uh, concept that we need to get our, wrap our head around, right? So, like I said before, the data that we're trying to send over a network could be just a couple of bytes, could be kilobytes, or maybe it could be gigabytes of data. Now, you can't force everything into a single packet and send it through a network, right? Because uh, intermediary devices could have many different capabilities. They're not going to be able to handle all that data in one single big gulp, right? So we have to break that data down into smaller segments. And this data is then given a, a TCP header, given, given basic uh, the service that we are using. So it could be a reliable communication or it could be unreliable communication. Because like I've said before in a previous slide, that uh, voice traffic or the real-time traffic, if it arrives too late, it becomes useless, right? Now, if I'm having a conversation with someone else in real time and my voice traffic arrives at the other end in maybe, let's say, 10, 15 seconds, it's no use at all. It has to come in real time. But since it's real time, we're going to give it unreliable transport method. It's fine. It doesn't mean that it's going to be discarded by intermediary devices. It just means that if some packets get lost during the transit, it doesn't matter. We're not going to retransmit that data. On a reliable communication, on the other hand, is the concept of ensuring that every single packet is sent from the sender to the receiver, right? So if I'm sending 10 packets to the other side, I need all of those 10 packets arrive at the other side. It doesn't matter if they arrive in different order, but I need all those packets to arrive at the other end. So that's reliable communication. It's TCP and UDP. User datagram protocol is used for unreliable and TCP is used for uh, reliable communication. And when it comes to network layer, so we have already added the TCP header to our data and then we are going to add a IP header to that data. And then on the IP header, we have these values. And it tells layer three devices, routers, what to do, where they should send that packet, right? That's essentially what it is. And at network layer, we had another header to it called frame header. So you can see that this process, it's encapsulating. Data is being encapsulated in into this 
TCP header is added, and then an IP header is added, and then a frame header is added, right? And then it's sent on the way. And once it arrives on the other end, this process is done again backwards, right? The frame header is removed, then the IP header is removed, the TCP header is removed, and the data is sent to the upper layers to be processed, right? And if we look at, let's go back to Wireshark again. You can see this here, right? Ethernet, and let me just change this back. I'm going to say back at details and when that frame arrives on the wire, these are the bytes that have been captured and this is the ethernet header, like I said. And where on layer two, we have MAC addresses. I, I think I mentioned that last week. These are the MAC addresses. These are the hardware, the physical addresses present in the network, right? So this is my computer's my MAC address. And on the other hand, there's a router and this is its MAC address. And when we go to layer three, we can see the IP addresses, right? And we can see the source IP, destination IP, and it's using UDP. Like I said before, right? Unreliable. And there's the time, time to live value. You know, on here, it's one to eight. I'll get to it. Bit later, then there's the UDP header, right? The service header, like I said, and it uses ports. We'll get to ports a bit later as well, right? So, like I said before, IP address is very important when it comes to networks. And the first question to ask is, what is an IP address, right? So, an IP address is actually just a bunch of bits. That's what an IP address is. It's used to assign an address to a network device, right? So it's a 32-bit sequence of ones and zeros, and it, it, it serves as an identifier to a computer on a network, right? It's just a numerical label that we assign to them so we can... Uh, reach that computer or address that computer, right? So every device that connects to a network is given an IP address, right? And like I've shown you already, packets are directed at this destination IP address. Without an IP address, we would be able to send data, right? If you need to send an email to someone, first thing that you need to do is actually get their email address, right? Without an email address, we can't send them anything, right? If you want to send a snail mail, right? A normal post mail, tapaling new address right? Nothing, oh, my friend is on the other side of the country. Tapal uh, mame, he's here's the envelope. Can you give it to him? Give you what in that way, right? We need to have an address. Right, so that's why we need an IP address, right? Okay, so this is an example of an IP address. Like I said, it's 32 zeros and it's divided into four eight bit chunks, right? So eight bits, eight bits, eight bits, eight bits, and it comes up to 32 bits, right? Now the complete, the entire address space of IPv4 is about 4.3 billion IP addresses. Or oh, that's from 32 zeros all the way to 32 ones, right? And if you look at the global population right now, it's close to, I think, 8.2 billion or something along those lines. And as of right now, IPv4 addresses, there's not enough IP addresses. If we assign an IP address to every single person on Earth, we don't have even half of 
the median that we have to at least somewhere around half, right? And the problem is we are not assigning a single computer to a single user, right? There's multiple, multiple devices that each person uses. There could be and businesses and other organizations could have hundreds of different computers, hundreds of different routers or servers and other network equipment. And we have already run out of IPv4 addresses actually. <clears throat> so there's a new version called IPv6 that has been introduced and it's being used, but still IPv4 addresses are still in use. They said that uh, it will be phased out in a couple of years or maybe in a decade, but still here we are. IP address IPv4 are, are still being used today, even in your, on your own computer. You, if you check, you'll see that uh, IPv4 addresses are there, right? So, so this is actually a DNS. I just put it in here to make another point. When we look at IP addresses, it's just a number, right? Now, the problem is that when you're communicating on the internet, you never really had to remember numbers in order to get to a website, right? I imagine if you're going to go to Facebook, or if you're going to go to Google, or if you're going on Twitter, or maybe some other site, you're using that site's name, right? You're not going to use that IP address. You're not going to say, okay, 210, 191, 200, 202, that goes to Google. You don't have to memorize that, right? That's actually done by something called DNS or uh, domain name service, if I'm not mistaken. And this actually converts or gets the IP address that's assigned to that uh, URL that we are trying to reach, right? So you can actually look up these IP addresses assigned to a site, right? Let's say that we need to look at the IP address of Google. And you can see these are the IP addresses that are used to reach Google, right? So if I say look up facebook.com right it's actually this ipv4 address or this ipv6 address so computers or the intermediary devices actually <coughs> don't understand this facebook or google or these names right Computers understand just numbers, the binaries, right? So that's why DNS is important. All right, let's continue. So when it comes to IPv4, there are five IP classes. Class A, B, C, D, and E, right? And... Based on the first octet, you can actually determine which class the IP address belongs to. And 0 to 127 belongs to class A. From 128 to 191 belongs to class B. Class C goes, goes from 192 to 223. Class D goes from, goes from 224 to 239. And class E actually goes from 242. 255, right? Now, the thing is, when it comes to these IP addresses, not all of them are equal. Right? Now, on the public internet, the IPs that are being used there are called public IP addresses. And those are routable through the internet. If you are connecting to internet from anywhere and you reach out to that IP address, you your traffic will be sent to 
that destination without any problems because all intermediary devices through various internet service providers, they will be able to carry that data to that intended destination because they know that destination or at least they know where to point that traffic so it gets to that destination. But private IP ranges are not like that. Private IP ranges have been designated to be used in private environments, in private networks. So in any organization or any home like we're using right now, these classes are the ones that are being used. These ranges within these three classes are what, what's used, what's accepted. So in class A, 10.00 slash 8 is what's used. In class B, it's 172.16.00 to 172.31. On class C, it's 192.168.0.0 slash 24 now. Right now, I'm actually using a class C IP address. Let me figure if I can just type. <laughs> it's 134. So yeah, as you can see, it's 192, 168, 1.34. So that's a class C IP address. If you look at your one, you'd be able to see it's a, it's definitely going to be either class C192, 168 something or it's going to be 10 something. So when we look at IP addresses, right? Uh, this this uh, notion of a subnet mask. So in a subnet mask is actually what's used to denote what portion of the network IP address is actually used to name the host and what portion of it is used to name the network because like i said before uh, the ip address can be divided into two sections there's the host portion and then there's the network portion now for a class c ip address the first three octets these separate three 8-bit portions are used to denote the network. And this last 8-bits are used to name the hosts, right? So now, if you, uh, if you remember your binary, 8-bits goes up to from zero all the way up to if you place uh, eight ones, it's 255, right? Because uh, this is one, this is two, four, eight, 16, 32. I wish I have uh, typed that here, but uh, 32, 64, and one, two, eight, right? So since it's just one and there's a four, it's 132, right? 128 plus 4, it's 132. And you can go all the way. So what we can say is the network 192.168.1, that's the network. And this is one of the hosts in that network. So 192.168.1.1, it goes to 192.168. 255. Five. Maybe we can use the last IP address, but for the sake of argument, we can use uh, these numbers, right? So we can use something called a subnet mask to denote what portion of the IP address is actually the network part and what portion of the IP address is actually left for hosts. So in here, you can see it says slash 24. This is a slash notation that's used to denote the network portion. So in here, you can see that 
Uh, there are three eight bits here. So eight times three is 24, right? Now, if you go back to class B, you can see it's actually slash 16. So this these two octets right here are the network portions and these two zeros are the host portions. This is the network. So it's 172.31 is the network. And these two octets are used to assign IP addresses to the hosts. So it goes from 172.31.0.1 all the way to okay all the way to 172.31.255.255.255 right so it, it it allows for a much much more broader range actually this only allows for 256 ip addresses this allows for somewhere around 16000 ip addresses this goes even further so as you can see it's just this single octet being assigned for network portion and all three octets here are given to hosts. So it allows for a significantly more host IP addresses, right? So uh, now these assignments are actually called, called a classful networking because as you can see, we are sticking to these uh, octets here always. So it's going to either be 8, 16, or 24. There's no in between. We're not going to say slash 10, uh, maybe slash 20. In classful networking, it's always going to be these uh, multiple amples of 8 to denote networks. But this is wasteful, right? Because uh, if you're using a class A network and just using 200 IP addresses, the others goes to waste, right? So instead, what we can do is actually divide these larger networks into multiple smaller networks that are more manageable. And it improves network efficiency and security because uh, in practical terms, when we look at networking in the enterprise, in a, in a business or an organization, we need to divide that network into separate segments based on business needs. Right? Now, if you're working in a bank or maybe in a finance institution, this would be uh, very obvious because there's sensitive data in there. There could be different users with different needs. And based on those business requirements, and security requirements, we would divide that network into different segments. Otherwise, let's say that entire bank or other organization's network consists of a single network. Everyone would be able to reach everyone else in that network. That would be a security nightmare, right? So we don't allow that. That's why segmenting is important and subnetting is one way that we can actually achieve it. Now, let's look at a subnetting example. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time, but we'll actually try to get through it with this example and hope you guys have, hope you guys get a, some sort of an idea about subnetting, right? Now, in this example, now, just ignore the network bits for a bit uh, and look at this portion. And one other thing that I forgot to mention is that this state right here, all zeros, this is called the network address. This is not being not used or assigned to a host. It's always left because it what we use to name the network itself, right? So let's say the, it's 192.168.1.0. We're going to say this is the network address. It's used to denote the network itself. It's not used or assigned 
to an IP address for a computer or a host. On the other hand, if we put all ones in here, that equates to 255. That's called the broadcast address. So it would be 192.168.1.255. That's not assigned to any host either because it's called the broadcast. If you send a packet to the destination that's the broadcast, because it's actually sent to every single host on the network. That's how IPv4 broadcast addressing works. Right? So essentially, when we look at the network host portion, the network address space that's used to assign IP addresses to hosts, it's actually whatever the number that you have here, minus two, right? And in subnetting, what we do is actually take bits from this host portion to divide this network into tinier portions, right? So instead of dividing at this octet range, we're going to take another bit from here, right? So the states that this allows us, we can set it to zero or we can set it to one. Right. So essentially, there are two states that allows us to have a network that's called 192.168.1.0 slash 25, because there are 24 bits here. We're going to take one from here to the network side. So it's all it has increased to 25 from 24. Now we can fill it, fill this with ones and we go one. One, 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 nano, go all the way to 127. Then we have to increment this by one. And we arrive at the next segment, the second subnet of this network. And that's 192.168.1.128. That's the network IP address that's not used for any host, it's used to denote the network itself, slash 25, and we go on and we can go up to 126 hosts. So there are two networks, here, right? So if we go to 26, we're going to take another zero from here, right? So it's going to be zero, zero, then it goes to this one is actually 64. This is one to eight because one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, and 128. The position of the bit denotes the network, right? So I'm going to say uh, 192, 168.1.0 slash 26, that's the first subnet. Then it's going to be 192.168.1.64. That's the second subnet. Then 128, that's the third subnet. And then if we go to uh, 192, and the last one is 255, right? So you can see that's how subnetting works. So Subnetting can be useful for this uh, segmentation purposes, right? And all right. So these are some basic troubleshooting uh, commands that everyone needs to know, right? Uh, and I think I have already shown you guys uh, IP config already. So if you go to the command line in Windows, it's IP config. And it shows the IP address of your computer, right? Apart from that, the next one that everyone uses is called ping. This is actually used to see whether a host is up or not. We need a dot here. So what it does is actually send 
a packet called ICMP or a ping. And it's sent to whatever the destination that I have set here. And it's going to if see whether it's reachable or not. We'll actually look at this traffic. All right. I'm just going to continue the saving. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ping, let's say, 1111. Right. This is Cloudflare, Cloudflare DNS, by the way. So I'm just going to stop it here. Unfortunately, I can't see the top of it. Really, let's go to sessions. Four. I just need to look at this. Don't worry about this, guys. Uh, we look at Wireshark a little bit later. But this is just what I wanted to just get rid of. This resolution. I don't need new resolution now. Okay, right. So, like I've said before, if I look at my own IP address again, it's 192.168.1.34, right? So, what happens is, I'm going to send from my source, 192.168.1.34, to this destination, something called an ICMP echo, a request. And the other side, this destination, then sends me a reply, right? So you can see that uh, I send one and I receive one. I'll send another one, then I'll send, receive another one. So you can see that Uh, maybe I have lost it. It actually sends four, right? And you can see that it's here, four packets. It has been sent and that has been received. And it's uh, it's one of the most useful tools for troubleshooting. If something is reachable or not, this is how, this is the first thing that we would do is to see whether we can ping that host or not. So if you look at, uh, again, at your IP config, you'll see something called the default gateway. At this point, your default gateway is going to be your router. Let's say if you have maybe fiber, it's going to be your fiber router's uh, interface. That's what's going to be your default gateway, right? And what you can do is actually check whether you can reach that default gateway or not. This is one of the first troubleshooting steps that we would do when we don't have access to the internet or anything else. See whether you can reach the default gateway. That's the first step that you take. So imagine that your router has uh, suddenly come across some issue and it's not responding. And you're trying to go to the internet and no traffic is coming in or going out. You can do this and see whether that router is actually reachable or not. It's the first line of troubleshooting that anyone should do, right? So that's the first one. The next one is called trace route. On Windows, it's trace RT. On Linux, it's the same. What trace route does is actually it traces the path that a packet would take. And you would be able to find Let's say that you're trying to reach the internet and you can reach the default gateway. Your router is working fine, but you're still not having any luck with reaching your intended destination. Maybe you're trying to go to YouTube. Maybe you're trying to go to Facebook. You can't get there, right? And you don't know where the issue lies, right? No, maybe you're a network admin. You have a bunch of different routers that goes from one location to the next. And you need to know where 
the traffic is going and how far it gets. And trace route can be used to do the detection, right? And I'm going to say trace route and I need to trace the path to 1.1.1.1, right? And it goes to the default gateway. It takes a little bit of time. Let's do... Don't worry about the tech ones. Uh, this one is a minus D is actually to do not resolve the names of these IP addresses and the wait for one second. That's it. Don't worry about it. And you can see that this is the path that our, that our packets take in order to get there, right? So you can see through the internet, this is the path that it took. Right, and we can actually look at that as well. Let's go through that, and I'm going to say trace route. All right. Okay. Now, when you look at it, right. Is the same thing, right? It goes to the destination. And if you look at this, the reply doesn't come from our destination. It came from another IP address, right? So if you look at from the beginning, here's something neat that most people don't know. Let's go to IP. I'm going to say time to live. I need to look at that. Now, like I mentioned before, right? Time to live is actually used to determine how many hops you can go, right? When a packet goes through a router and it's processed by router, this value is decreased by one. Right. So what this what trace route does is it sends the packet, but it's it sets the time to leave to one in the first one. So it goes to the first hop. And from the first hop, it says, oh, okay, you know, I can't send this any further. Your time to leave exceeded. One decrement uh, decreased by one is zero. So it's going to say you have reached, you can't, uh, this can't be sent any further. And that's it, right? Then well, what, what this uh, source is going to do is increment this by one. And so it's going to send two. So we can go to the next stop. We can go to the first one, this one dot one, and the next one, next hop actually replies to us. And then we increase it to three. And we can go from this one to the next stop that there is. And we continue from there, incrementing this one by one until we get to the destination. By doing this, we're actually able to determine the amount of hops there are to our destination. This is very useful and pretty cool actually to see how this is done, how trace route actually works, right? So if you have time, if you have uh, Wireshark installed, you can try and see this. It's pretty impressive, right? Now, if, if you look at the response, right? Each network device may set time to live based on different conditions. And we're just uh, from the initial packet that we have sent, we have set it to one and we have increased it by one, right? But if you look at the replies, they have all set it to either 64 or 254, 251, depending on the device and the configuration. But you can see that they have set plenty of time to live value. So it 
it comes back to us without any issues, right? So it's a pretty neat command to know. It's a neat command to use, right? For troubleshooting purposes, it can be a godsend. And telnet, on the other hand, uh, telnet is another command that we can use to determine what services are available or services are running on the other end for a host, right? So let's say that uh, we are trying to reach Google and I need to know whether HTTPS is running on the other end. So I can say 443 is for the port number. And if I do, if the service is running, you will either get a reply or this black window, right? This is important um, when you're doing some reconnaissance to run whether a target is running a service. This is the first thing that we would do, right? Then I'm going to say Google and dot com, and I'm going to say some random port number, and it's trying to connect, but on the other end, there's no reply, right? So that can be pretty useful, useful for various circumstances. And the last one is NS lookup. Like I said before, IP addresses are not being used by people. And what we use is uh, URLs or domain names, right? So we can look up the IP addresses of a given name, right? So NS lookup, let's say facebook.com. And when you use NS lookup, you can determine the IP address of that site, right? So it's pretty useful. It's used for many different purposes. We use it uh, regularly for many different tasks. So these are some of the basic troubleshooting commands that you should learn and you should use. You would be using on a pretty much daily basis when you're a network engineer or IT person in general. So I think uh, given the time, uh, let's wind down the session for today because uh, there's a lot that we need to cover. And for the time being, I think uh, we can end this session from this point. All right. Anyways, uh, do you guys, if you guys have any questions, uh, I think now would be the time to ask. If not, we will end today's session. Right? Anyone? All right, awesome. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so let's end today's uh, session from this point and we'll continue at a later time right all right so thank you very much for joining today's session we'll see you guys next week right all right Ayesha. thank you very much <laughs> good night good night everyone else uh have a great weekend guys all right